Okay, starting again, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully you won't see the part that we're starting again, but that's okay. Uh, it's Gordon Einstein. It's your Dubai local friendly crypto blockchain and soon to be AI attorney. Uh, I would like to welcome on to the show a very special guest, uh, James Bernard, who is a tech veteran from here in Dubai or working here in Dubai, but from around the world, which we'll get into in a second. And he is going to bring us up to speed on the current tech scene in Dubai and what he's involved in. He's an advisor to a huge number of companies. But what's also interesting about him is he has a lot of background in history or access to history of Dubai as it's developed as the sort of tech and blockchain hub. So we'll get into all these details, but James, welcome to the show. How are you? Thanks, Gordon. Doing very well. Um, just out of the country for the Eid week, but uh, back next week for Token 49. Looking forward to seeing you. Yes, well, thank you very much. And yes, I think everyone's coming to Dubai for Token 49. So there's a lot to talk about with you. You're, you're a man who's seen a lot and done a lot, but let's get a little bit of background. Where are you from? Uh, born in UK, uh, Yeovil, South West Country, uh, but grew up in Holland in the Netherlands. So um, until wow. I was about 16, then went back to school in uh, the UK for a few years and then university in the UK, and then went straight into a job in London broking. So financial background, uh, trading, uh, that particular first job was, uh, you know, tough repo market in London, broking for a couple of years, and then moved on into commodity trading. So for about the next 10 years, I became uh, a commodity trader, physical commodities, futures, uh, options, and um, based out of London. Um, but the, um, the sort of track there was always to sort of try and do something on my own, which is quite tough in that business because of the trade finance you need. So along the way, I actually set up my own trading firm and um, that took me back to the Netherlands, funnily enough, being a sort of distribution hub, if you like, for the whole of, whole of the world uh, for certain products. And um, I actually set up my first company there, a bit of a JV with a Chinese conglomerate. So we were producing metals in uh, China uh, and a couple of other countries and uh, Holland became our hub, a distribution hub. And Are you um, producing so them in China or for China? It was, um, we produced in China and uh, we were producing and uh, moving materials all over the world, but we had a big stock in in Mordijk and Rotterdam in the Netherlands. So we used to ship out around the world for just-in-time deliveries. So we became the biggest magnesium magnesium alloy uh, supplier in the world. Um, and actually, that's that's my first experience of Dubai. We were a supplier supplier of Dubai aluminium. Uh, you know, one of the great big aluminium um, producers of the world, and um, and of course Bahrain as well, aluminium Bahrain. Um, and then that really brought me to my first business trip to to Dubai back in, I think it was around 2005. Uh, so yeah, background in commodities and trading. And I think a lot of, uh, a lot of commodity traders ended up in, in crypto, in Web3. Doing I've noticed that. Thing. I was about to comment yeah. about that. Why do you think that is? I think, I think we've got a, a risk for, uh, sorry, an appetite for risk. <laughs> and um, and initially, that's that's um, what you had to have. Um, I wouldn't say we're the most sort of tech orientated people, but you know we grew into that um, fast pace, uh, new 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 initiatives. Everything in trade came online, and and it all became to do you know with latency and and who was there and who knew what. So a bit like a bit like Web three at the moment. So um, yeah, that's that's a bit about my background, and I. Moved to Dubai in 2006 to join DMCC. Funnily enough, I was offered a job on a business trip there in 2006 or 2005, I think it was, by DMCC. So I came over. There is a, just for a little bit of history, because the whole world's watching this. That's a Dubai multi multi commodity center. Yes. Yeah. So DMCC, Dubai multi commodity center. It's a free zone, economic zone, and. Um, Back before I joined, they were extremely focused on uh, a lot of different commodity groups. And um, of course, they have Dubai Gold and Commodity Exchange, which is the first and largest uh, derivatives exchange in the region. So I was um, seconded to join DMCC as Associate Director of Commodities. And I worked on the DGCX to 
produce futures contracts, mainly in polymers, so plastics, futures contracts, which the London Metal Exchange had done a similar sort of thing at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and the rest of the world was trying to sort of hedge their, their plastic requirements. So that's what, that's how I first came to DMCC. Um, Sorry, actually, I'm going to pepper you with questions because this, this is interesting. When did the DMCC form? DMCC, I think, was around 2002. Um, okay. So I was I was sort of late, if you like. Um, by 2006, you know, Ahmed bin Salam had been there from the beginning, and and um, my uh, the boss, the first CEO of the company that I knew was uh, Dr. David Rutledge, who has um, who has uh, long gone by now. But um, yeah, massive commodities background, and um, yeah, they'd been doing business for a long while, but they were based in Emirates Towers, and the free zone hadn't been uh, built. Um, so it was just a big plot of land with bits and pieces uh, it's carved out of it. And uh, Almas Tower, I think we moved into in, in 2008, 2009. Uh, that was the sort of first part. And before then, when I was working at DGCX, I actually didn't really understand that we had a free zone, So, um, which, which nowadays is sort of a huge part of the business. So it was, um, yeah, it was great to, to, to sort of become part of that. And in 2000, I'm, sorry, I'm going to interview again. You're, you're right. There, when I hear DMCC, I think free zone, but yeah. you're, you're implying that there's a whole nother channel or aspect to it that, that like the branding in my brain is highly associated with the free zone. But I, I think you're, you're saying there's a lot of functionality in there. That's not necessarily related to the free zone, but it's just unique because of what it offers with respect to commodities and contracts. Am I hearing that correctly? You are, yeah. Uh, originally, um, and and still today, I mean, this is how it got its reputation. It was very involved in um, oil and gas. They had their own you know, director of that particular vertical. Um, jewels, precious stones, diamonds, pearls, uh, then the gold side, precious metals, um, and, and tea, coffee. It's really become uh, an expert in, in a lot of different verticals, and some were followed up in terms of um, yeah, I'm speaking on their behalf as a non-DMCC employee, but you know, I, so I, I won't hold it against you. It's okay. <laughs> but um, they 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 obviously followed up in terms of the amount of infrastructure they built, depending on how much value they thought they could add. So they've been very clever in terms of okay, well, they can add a lot of value in tea, mm -hmm. um, in coffee, in diamonds, in gold, and now in um, technology in different verticals. So that's. Um, that's how it is now. Before there was sort of looking at different verticals in in oil and gas as well, um, but but the free zone has become a huge part, obviously, of it, and uh, and a very successful part of it as well. But still, to today, there's different verticals. So there's the oil and gas. You know, they have a club for that. There's a club mm -hmm. for tea, and coffee, and obviously diamonds and and the rest. So and today, Web three, obviously. Interesting. Okay, you're you're adding a lot of new ones. That I, I gotta be honest. I know them and I work with them, but I wasn't aware, hadn't thought about this. So this is really helpful. So when you when you were brought in to work on polymers and you're developing the contracts for it, walk me through that. Are, are different commodities that they have? Is it a boilerplate contract for each kind of commodity, or is it highly tailored depending on the kind of commodity it is? What does it mean it's to develop those contracts? Yeah, it's highly tailored, and they look um, very deeply into each vertical before they um, go any further. For instance, um, I know Ahmed's working on water, so he doesn't take that lightly. He would look at the need for you know having a water center and what that means. Um, Web three, obviously, when when we started the crypto center, it was very much about okay, well, what where can we add value? What does it mean for the UAE? What does it mean for Dubai? Um, what are the what are the bits and pieces that we can do to add to the industries such as you know ecosystems, um, accelerators, incubators, uh, networking, whatever it is. And obviously, tea and coffee were you know, coffee roasting, coffee blending, all those types of facilities. There would have been a huge amount of work that went into looking at that as a, a, a separate project. Where they can add value before they actually went ahead with it. So not boiler boilerplate at all, um, but very individual sort of projects, if you like. Interesting. Now, now going going back to your commodities history in Europe and the magnesium trading, is this, and given also the the time it took place, is this a relationships business where you need to know people in order to find these goods and move them around? 
Is it who's faster on the terminal? Like what's the, what's your daily dynamic? Well, it used to be, uh, when I first got into physical commodities, my, um, my bosses back then would say that they used to trade from state to state in America. So they had fertilizer and, you know, their neighbors wouldn't know where to get it. And they had it, there wasn't the internet or anything. So you were in a really sort of, um, a good position if you had certain suppliers. Then, of course, move forward, you know, 10 years, the the web, the internet came, um, everyone knew everyone, you could easily get access to who was selling what. Um, so it got harder and harder. Uh, you had to have real sort of added value. One of the companies I worked for, we, we took raw materials and we, you know, roasted them and they became something else. And then we were selling long term contracts and financial products um, into the same industries. So then you had a, an advantage over others, but really, it's all very much screen screen based now, uh, because of the, the 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 opaqueness of it all. Interesting. Okay, it, it's a, it's a it's a fascinating world, and of course, I think you and I are kind of generationally close. You know, in my in my mind, I have the the Wolf of Wall Street, you know, um, Michael Douglas image of the hard charging trader on the floor, you know, yeah. yelling and screaming, and it's who they know. Yeah. Was, it, was that at, at all what you were experiencing? <laughs> that's why I got into it that was like that was the exciting part of it but um you know I started after leaving university straight into broking in London and you know you're up at five in the morning and you're uh out late entertaining and you're um screaming at each other at a desk all day so it's not it's not as glorious as it sounds but it's definitely exciting and when they closed the open pit you know the open cry out cry it was um it was a sad day because we all remember that but yeah, it's no longer like that, but but you know, it's still exciting for some. But I've moved on. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. Now, now, sorry. I just love your background, and I think it's interesting. Okay, so the DMCC recruits you. Carry forward, as you were saying. Yeah. So, two thousand and six, um, DGCX mainly, and um, then of course we had the financial crisis coming towards mm -hmm. us, which I felt a little bit later than uh, the US and and London did. But of course, that's when DMCC was really opening its doors for business in terms of property uh, and companies moving into the free zone. So I was moved across to head up uh, business development, client relationship management, and the whole team got together and we basically revamped DMCC's licensing, compliance, regulations, you know, all this type of things to make to make for a different world, if you like, because everything had to be a lot simpler. It wasn't really a property play at that point of time. It was just making it as easy as and as affordable for, uh, for businesses as possible and for them to have a good reason to be in Dubai. So that took me into a whole different world. But of course, it was um, it was my DMC. It was my commodities background, which really helped me to link into these companies that we had first were, you know, we were attracting. They were from all different part of the commodity world mm -hmm. and um, I could relate to them so it was still exciting for me to be part of all of that it's interesting but it's a very different business I mean one moment you're you're crafting a market and contracts that are very focused on on the nature of the commodity themselves if I'm understanding you correctly and then you're doing a pretty strong change if you're kind of going down the corporate law formation route and yeah. trying to compete with other international bases and free zones and yeah. also Dubai I think even then was a competitive environment even within Dubai or with Abu Dhabi so yeah. that's, a, that's, yeah, a lot, right. that's a lot of legwork yeah it was and we had a whole um a whole free zone but the joy of uh of DMCC and Jumeirah Lakes Towers was that it it was one of the first freehold areas um mm -hmm. so people could actually buy their property they could buy the the offices that they were going to be in and and of course the markets were very good then and we had landlords that were owning properties that wanted to rent them out mm -hmm. so um there, it was a really good time and we we all had to sort of change the way we did business and um and we all sort of bonded and got on with everything it was like all hands to the pump really uh which was fun and of course we had to go at the same time and encourage companies from all around the world to to you know shift and and have some sort of setup in Dubai, which actually wasn't that difficult. Uh, amazingly enough, I know everyone in uh, in the world had their different challenges at that time, but I think people often in recession times look 
to um, grow, like to take advantages of different elements. And so we were on the radar of a lot of companies, um, Dubai as a whole, and um, and DMCC really stood out with with what it could offer. So no, it was really great. I really enjoyed it beforehand. Working in commodities trading was different, but this was still on a on a, a similar sort of um, parallel, if you like, because all of the companies we would bring in mainly were in the commodities um, arena. But that changed going on. Uh, we, we opened up to a lot a lot of other different sectors as well. Right, which we're obviously going to explore. The, is the reason, I mean, a lot of people obviously were severely damaged by 2008. Is the reason you weren't so much and the commodity companies weren't so much is just the nature of commodities? They're not they're not subject to the same business cycle as, say, real estate was or the other elements of the economy? What, what, what do you attribute it to? No, they were. Um, it's just that um, in, the, in a time of recession, quite a lot of uh, companies do look at you know, what they can do to uh, slim down, um, get more efficient, uh, explore new markets. I see. And of course, Dubai was a great option for that, whatever business you're in, really. It was just that DMCC was quite known for commodities at the time. So we could take real advantage of that. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of free zones, I'm not sort of um, dimin diminuing, diminishing, diminuing, uh, whatever, demeaning um, other free zones. But of course, DMCC had a real sort of uh, importance in terms of commodities and therefore we took advantage of that and there was an extra element of what we could offer the understanding of what these companies were doing and and supporting them so we were quite successful in doing that and I understand. Um, That's clever okay so move me forward in time with your career and what you saw develop yeah so um Throughout the stages, so I, so DMCC grew into a, a lot of different sectors. So not just commodities, we looked at other, and one of the first ones was obviously technology. So at that time we looked at what we could offer. So we decided to try and get into the accelerator business. So we mm -hmm. teamed up with Astro Labs, uh, Astro Labs at the time um, were uh, Google for startups. Mm -hmm. I think it was Google for entrepreneurs back then, but you know, Google, Google linked and they were the first company to set up a, a physical entity with us that we worked as a JV um, yeah. in terms of an accelerator, which in itself attracts a lot of companies in. So that was our first move in, in that space in DMCC's first move in that space to, uh, to really sort of um, uh, to, to find another vertical, another activity, bunch of activities that we could attract into the, into the free zone. So um, that's actually actually pretty radical. I mean, that that's one we can almost say that's going against brand if you're a commodity center. And now here also here you are in technology. I mean, how did you how did you guys have the courage to do that? <laughs> well, yeah, I it was it was an interesting time and and maybe you should get Ahmed on on, on I will on, I'll, I'll on, get him and you know everything you were saying is pretty complimentary. So we'll we'll, we'll let him give his <laughs> oh, word. No, 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 certainly that was that wasn't like I'm not going to answer, but you know, it was like yeah, he he'd love to talk about this, but yeah, it was it was it's outside of your box, isn't it? It's um it's thinking outside and and taking some risks, but at the same time, we we felt we could do it. We felt we we had the connections, and we were almost encouraged to be entrepreneurial in our thinking at, at that time, which was great. So we were lucky to have the support of of someone like Astro Labs and and Google. So that became the first of many other sort of similar centers of um, whether they're incubators or accelerators in in different in different verticals. You know, jump forward to two thousand and one when the crypto center opened, which is another sort of uh, two thousand one or two thousand twenty one. Oh, sorry, two thousand and twenty one. Yeah, um, but that took that took a good few years to or a couple of years to to sort of uh, work out what it was going to be, the partners and, um, you know, how it was going to add value. So everything that was done was was done with purpose and pre-thought and, and showing what added value that would bring to, to DMCC and, and to the to the members of DMCC. So. It's really interesting because in my, in my mind, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, there's sort of like three species of free zones. There's the federal law ones, the financial centers, DI, FCE, and ADGM. And they're, I don't mean this in a bad way, just kind of reality check. They're, they're sort of creatures of the government, creatures of policy. 
They're they're built to be Emirates New Yorks, if, if you like. And then there's the the sort of more um, corporate free zones, I guess you can call them, like every, everyone else. But DMCC, in my brain, I don't know why, seems to operate alone a, a third position, you know, because commodities are sort of between financial instruments and, and companies. And it's 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 interesting how much what I'm hearing is you've given a lot of thought and analysis, analysis and policy background to every decision on every vertical you create. You're, you're not just kind of throwing up against the wall and saying, now we're going to attack this market. You're you're evaluating the market and then customizing an environment for that vertical. And I yeah. think that's, I think that's, and it's not the government telling you to do it or comp competing with another financial center. And it's not something very simple, like just a standard corporate type freeze on you're, you're, you're interesting kind of hybrid is, 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 yeah. is there anything to this impression? Is this right? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the, I think DIFC and ADGM are sort of financial centers. So they have their own regulatory environment, which, which is globally accepted. Um, they're, they're, um, they're very polished, uh, very successful, and 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 they definitely have their place in the in the business. In Sorry, the right. I, I I I didn't mean to say they don't, but the, you know the the financial standards globally are reasonably defined. We all we kind of know how a financial system is supposed to operate. We're supposed to we kind of know how it's not supposed to operate, and yeah. you kind of get in trouble when you don't do it that way. So they they have pretty tight rails on that, on which they need to run. Yeah. The DMCC, the commodities of the world is a little bit more free flowing, and you're not just in commodities, you're doing tech also. You could just, because yeah. it, it's semi unregulated or less regulated, you, you could just improvise or just kind of go for it. But I'm hearing a yeah. lot of analysis and a lot of thought before you jump on, in each one of these verticals. You, you kind of have alluded to it with the polymers, and you alluded to it with water, and you alluded to it with technology. And, with, and I think we're going to get to it with the crypto. It, it, it's, it's interesting. You're kind of acting like a advisory group to a government in a way yeah. oh totally it's um so and that and that was i think taken very seriously in terms of gold and diamonds um mm -hmm. important to the economy uh the the trade the, the the actual trade of diamonds and gold which is physical trade as well as you know forwards and so on. but in terms of um in terms of a free zone so a free zone uses the regulatory environment of whatever whatever it needs to so most of the free zones in dubai apart from obviously um difc they aren't regulators so they have to use a financial regulator a health regulator um, any other regulatory body if yes. they have activities in the free zone from companies that cover those activities so we were um when we were uh initially looking at crypto obviously we um, I mean, it's a, it's probably a leap ahead in our conversation, but but it it's was... okay. Let, let's leap. So, to take us down your crypto path at DMCC, it's time. Tell okay. Us. So so I guess um, for me, the crypto journey started in about 2014, okay. um, learning Early. about crypto and um, and what was going on globally, and um, and then I didn't really have the nerve to sort of say what DMCC should do in it as as I had been so vocal in, in other activities because it was pretty unknown. And even then the technology beneath you know blockchain, uh, beneath Bitcoin and and then other technologies as well, like you know, Ripple and mm -hmm. and things earlier adopters. But I um leading up to that um we had no sort of mandate in terms of what activities we should offer and which we shouldn't so this became a vertical i guess when the dubai global blockchain council decided that they wanted to um explore it further and the mandate there was to look at blockchain dlts around the world and the technology to see what um to see what i guess the government and private sector could learn and to uh, what could be brought into the to the UAE, um, and also what companies could be attracted. Of course, we're always looking at that. And and although crypto was the most known word rather than blockchain, mm -hmm. it was decided that the Global Blockchain Council should be called that because crypto sort of was um, encroaching into the financial regulatory uh, area. And of course, we didn't want to be 
um, discussing stuff which needs to be discussed by a regulator. So it was much it was much too early for that. So we had a, the great think tank under um, the Dubai Future Foundation, which was the Global Blockchain Council and DMCC and Ahmed, myself and a bunch of other names which are synonymous with um, crypto and blockchain now were, were involved in it. Um, wow. We were just one of, one of the parts of it. And that was 2016. And You're pretty um, early still. It was, yeah, it was really early. It was, um, I mean, Dubai is well known for being early in technology, seeing, recognizing things and supporting it faster than other jurisdictions because other jurisdictions tend to be uh, looking at it a bit on a, a sort of more regulatory front before they've actually got the um, the technology up and running. So I think Dubai is doing it, it has done it the right way this time um, and times before. But the Blockchain Council was, was really a, a great way to make all eyes focus on it. So it got the big companies to come and have a look at what blockchain was and how they could use it. We did pilot projects. Uh, we had a couple of um, proof of concepts. One of the pilot projects that we did, um, well, I'd say it was more proof of concept than pilot, to be honest, but we, uh, Ahmed was on the, he was chairing the Kimberley process back then, yes. um, is, which is diamond focus. So we were able to look at um, blockchain, how it could be used in the Kimberley process. And so the, let's, let's flesh that out a little bit, because that's a topic that's interest to, of interest to me, but I'm not sure the audience it was all about it. So if I understand correctly, that's a way of distinguishing conflict diamonds from non-conflict diamonds with raw yes. diamonds, yes? Or exactly. There's, there's a bunch of countries, maybe, I, I don't know the exact number, maybe 60 countries around the world who are part of the Kimberley process, and they uh, certify all the diamonds, um, and they have offices around the world. DMCC runs the UAE office, yes. and all diamonds that are imported, exported, have to go through these centers which check the you know accreditation and all this kind of stuff but you know really there was um there was a back then there was a gap in technology in terms of how you can actually link you know mind mind diamonds um all the way to a diamond in a ring um and what was the requirement for that and to be honest it was a bit early because back in 2016 mm. not all of the countries on the list um and quite a lot of them didn't have constant internet access mm. uh, so that made it even more challenging to then try and suggest that they would have a, a blockchain solution to something which had been paper-based for quite a while. But now there is a there is a big shift, and there's been a lot of companies across the diamond uh, world in general. Um, and funnily enough, I was talking to someone earlier today who is ex De Beers, and he was telling me about the incredible blockchain solution that they've developed um for for diamonds for track and tracer diamonds all the way from what you call unpolished um diamonds which are you know covered in mud and everything all the way up to a diamond ring so is this person named Jacques? sorry is this person named Jacques? no it's a it's a it's a english gentleman who's um who's now retired from from them but um okay. he was uh, you probably he was, know who i'm talking about but just seeing okay yeah, sure. There's a, lot, there's a lot of people that have been doing track and trace. And, you know, it's, of course, um, real world asset, blockchain use of real world asset is huge. So there's a lot of people are trying to find the best solutions for these and different, you know, different gems, different commodities are different animals. I mean, the diamonds are, are uh, you know, you can't put any water, liquid, whatever into a diamond. So you have to look at solutions. You know, if you look at gems, there you know you can put a liquid into them, so you could mm. you could try DNA um, DNA solution. So you have to look at different commodities in different ways. And if it's if it's you know at this time if it's worth. Oh, you froze. All right, ladies and gentlemen, he'll be back in a second. I'm sure. To property, so the uh, property ownership transfer of property type. Hmm. Oh, you're freezing. James, James, James. James, you 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 froze for about fifteen seconds there. So you're so from track <laughs> yeah, and trace. 
you, you yeah, froze. We did a, yeah, so then after that, we did a bit of a um, we did a bit of a pilot on uh, transfer of ownership, ownership, so title transfer on property, but it was uh, based on our um, our you know sort of serviced offices. So it was just you know, we were very early in 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 what we were doing, and funnily enough, um, Austin from Kraken and um, and we had uh, Ola from Bit Oasis, and we were working on projects at DMCC with with their technology as well to to try and sort of give good examples of what could be done with blockchain. So incredibly useful time. Um, and so maybe let, I let, let me comment for a second. It, it's interesting when this took place because in I have to admit in 2016 I was not Dubai aware at all. My focus was more Ukraine, Malta, and Gibraltar. And I remember at this time both those jurisdictions were going to become crypto island. And they were both trying to brand that way. And they were both trying to get the regulatory infrastructure and the regulator in infrastructure in place. And to a certain extent, it's kind of like the, the mouse who roared because they, they didn't or couldn't, and I, I say this publicly, they couldn't follow through, or at least they didn't at that time. And with Gibraltar, it was going to become the big tokenization platform. But now, now they're really good when it comes to crypto funds. Um, I had James Lashley on the on the show. He's going to be coming out soon uh, from Hassan's, and he's a lawyer who really pioneered it and got it working. And Malta seemed to be making good strides, but I, I think between the lack of banking and the lack of regulatory depth, they didn't quite pull it off yet. To just be super blunt, yet here's little Dubai in 2016 plunging ahead, and we're both here with Varas, and it's. It's yeah. kind of, I mean, maybe I was just out of the loop. I, I, I don't know if it was on the radar in 2016, but listen to all the good work they're doing. It was something as complicated as the Kimberley process. I mean, yeah. Well, funnily crazy. enough, you know, you're, you're, you're perfectly right. Um, there was a lot of people uh, looking to, to lead this space and be the place to come. Um, just to sort of fill in a bit more info on that, you know, in terms of, 2016, 17, we then had the um, Securities and Commodities Authority, which is the mainland and free zones regulator for you know, financial activities, um, actually more of the mainland than free zones, but financial regulator um, that covers commodities as well. So they were looking at it and they actually drafted papers on, um, on crypto as they saw it. So before VARA, there was the SCA who had drafted papers on what the regulatory environment should be. Um, but then the uh, Virtual Asset Regulatory Authority uh, took over from, um, I see them as being more commercial friendly, if you like, but SCA is still, you know, still are part of the, I'd say, digital virtual asset um regulatory environment across the uae uh, it's just vara has made it so much easier uh, so much more commercial uh um and understanding the companies that are coming in and who 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 would make up a good ecosystem i think uh I, i'm gonna take you into maybe choppy waters and then we can pull back if, you, if you're not comfortable with it I, I had breakfast this morning with a lawyer who will rename nameless who's in this space also along with me and that lawyer's complaint was that Vara seems very focused on Binance size clients. And when it comes to smaller entrepreneurial teams, especially those looking to issue tokens, they're hitting a little bit of a brick wall and falling back to or falling over to British Virgin Islands. And he's, he was expressing some frustration that 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 also could be a mouse to who roared. And Vara maybe needs to do a better job there so yeah. think, no no comment think, or anything to say yeah sure no i i'm happy to talk because um yeah i i because you're that guy I, I don't need to hide anything for any anyone i've worked with vara from almost day one you know um it's uh it's 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 had its changes i'd say um uh, it's got better uh from the very beginning sure. i mean it was a massive massive um feat to achieve what they've done. I think they've le learned a lot along the way um, and, and got a lot of good advice. The, mm -hmm. I, just, I just think they're totally, um, uh, they have so much, so, so many companies that are applying that it's a little bit difficult to, uh, to treat everyone the same way. And of course, everyone wants sort of more solid companies 
to be in there because we don't want big failures, uh, you know, that have, that have happened um, globally. Sure. You know, the regulators have brought them in and then they've blown up. Um, so I, there's a lot of due diligence that needs to be done. I've got a couple of companies that I advise um, who have gone through VARA um, and they they were they had a really good experience. But I guess it's okay. just you know, like anything, it's just um, depends on your timing, what documents you have, what stage you're at. Maybe you're not maybe you're not aware of what stage you need to be at to have a VARA, you know, regulatory license. Um, but I, I think it'll get a lot better. Uh, it must be incredibly difficult because you've got to balance so many incredibly uh, difficult topics because, as you know, as well as I do, crypto tends to cross over between a lot of different verticals, you know, into the financial sector, banking, um, you know, a lot of other potentially regulated environments. So they've got to be careful about that as well and come up with good advice. So I guess it's that. But like any new organization, they're they're um, they're trying to move as fast as possible. I have, fair enough, and, and I think the the they, they don't want an FTX style blow up because that can set the market back years, if not forever. And yeah. you know, we we just got off the FATF gray list, so I know I, I make, makes feelings. But the, the 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 word on the street, if you like, is that Barra was sort of overwhelmed and unresponsive in the beginning because they were overworked, because it was new, and they seem to have gained some muscle mass over the past yeah. period and to be processing better, things better, more professionally, more quickly, and be, to be more responsive. So yeah. I think I think yeah. it's fair to view it as a process. And it's also fair to view it in relative to other jurisdictions. I mean, it, it, the U.S., as big as it is, has no VARA. It's just, no. it's just kabuki theater regulation. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah at, you, least, you, at least we have a regulator. Yeah, if you think about it as a business, because you know we're all they're all businesses, they have to make money. Um, if you think about if they start to build up the team, then of course that that cost is going to transfer into licensing fees. So ined inevitably, they want to be as streamlined as possible. Um, so I guess they're uh, yeah they're in a, a bit of a difficult situation. But I think most people are, are satisfied, if you like. But, you know, they're a regulator. I don't think many people are satisfied with regulators globally, are they? <laughs> uh, uh, good point. Touche. Okay, so take us through the rest of your DMCC crypto journey. Okay. Um, well, I guess after the uh, Blockchain Council, we had the first blockchain event, which was at Burj Ara, which was great. Mm -hmm. Then we sort of moved on to SCA, Securities and Commodities Authority. We did a lot of um, uh, help gave them a lot of help in that. And then VARA came on the scene. And then we were sort of thinking about what we should do in terms of the space of uh, incubation, acceleration. And we uh, started working with Ralph, um, who we all know, from e Labs and uh, now Crypto Oasis. And in 2020, we signed an agreement. I say we the whole time, but it's not we, it's DMCC. So. Um, DMCC signed an agreement in Davos, and then in 2021. And, and I'm sorry, just for totally clear, we're talking about the DMCC Crypto Center. Yes. Okay, and, and you were you were what in the DMC Crypto Center? Uh, oh, personally, was I was working on anything crypto, so that was my role. So I was head of business development. So my role was to come out with new uh, ideas to create different uh, ecosystems, if you like. So. The crypto center was just part of how can we form a physical, uh, virtual, um, say value add that, that will attract clients. And so we saw what had been done in Switzerland, you know, great example of how to bring everyone together, networking, yes. provide services. And um, so we thought, let's involve them. And so we did. Uh, my role was was to do everything, you know, basically inception. You, you, I, I knew you were in the middle of it. I, I just want to kind of get the camera on it. So, okay, so you're, you're working with, I always, I can never pronounce, pronounce his last name, Ralph Golubich, whatever it is. You, you can probably yeah. say it better than I can. <laughs> yeah, so so um, Ralph and I, I think, met in 2019, and he was very keen in in doing stuff in the UAE, and I was fighting DMCC's corner and said, Let, you know, you got to come here. We got to do something, so we did, 
and that was the the initial crypto center that was opened um, in 2021 and has done extremely well and can, and i think mainly you know sort of as as the the crypto world or web3 world is so decentralized it doesn't really have a sort of center if you like so the crypto right. center is just one of many environments across the uae uh, and even in dmcc but it's been it's been a building block i guess it's a, an initial building block to to say we have something and to attract companies to the UAE and say, oh, you know, are you part of this environment? Um, and you know the story. You've had other uh, guests on uh, Sakar and people who have like grown the crypto oasis into another ecosystem, which is, I, I, I guess, everyone's part of the whole network. If you like, if you're in Web three, you need to be part of the whole whole network. I'd say you, you, um, need, you need to be pretty nimble. So, yeah. and, and I, I know the DMC did brought in a huge number of companies, like a, a shocking number got formed. So I, I, yeah. I think what you did was a big success. And well, well I can tell you um, back in, I think I'm just guessing 2017, something around that period, um, we developed the first uh, official license activity, which was proprietary trading in crypto commodities. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of activity you could have as a as a company. Mm -hmm. So we were like pretty swamped with interest for that. The the idea was that you know traders could come in and have a company, you know, get visas, bank account, whatever, and trade crypto because there was a lot of you know cryptos, OTCs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, we had uh, the DMCC got quite a number of companies from that, and that was back in 2017, I think. So early. Uh, that was early on and then we did another one which was distributed ledger technology license because we wanted to separate it from the conventional kind of um software house software labs that kind of thing um and so that was another uh, license and we you know i'm told by more of the uh, local ogs that 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 was one of the reasons that sca started looking at regulating the space um so they saw the need from companies uh, mm -hmm. which sort of started sort of VARA. Um, so DMCC did a lot in that space to to move things forward. But UAE as a whole has been has been great. Sure. But, you know, you, you always need someone in, in front to like, you know, trailblaze, which it sounds like you did. So carry us forward with your life and your career. This is, I feel like I'm getting to know James. <laughs> Yeah, so I um, I kept working for DMCC until 2022. I sound like I, I still work there, I know, but uh, it's hard when you've been with somewhere, some company for 17 years. Um, Understandable. To sort of take it out of your vocabulary. <laughs> um, and I still, today, I work closely with them. I have maybe four or five companies at DMCC mm -hmm. uh, across different sectors. Um, at the moment, I, uh, I work for a um, AI company as one of my- um, Sorry, I gotta ask, was there anything we should mention between 22 and AI company? So 20, between 22 and the AI company, I did a short stint um, at, uh, at um, in Russell Hamer, mm -hmm. right now. So uh, I was the uh, chief commercial officer at RecDAO. And um, yeah, I basically did six months with them, and you know, then felt that I really wanted to go back and do my own my own bits and pieces. I, I was seeing too many companies coming through the door that were having fun doing their own, you know, entrepreneurial ventures, and and I missed that. And you got so FOMO. I, I got. <laughs> I certainly did. Um, so yeah. Right, so fair, I, fair uh, enough. I, I just didn't want to leave it out. Okay, so this, cool. then. I, I, a lot of my friends, you know, whilst I was there, I, I brought on board a, a bunch of um, of of uh, guys that I've worked with throughout the years who are still there and uh, and enjoying it, and I think they're doing pretty well. So, um, once I left them, I went back into my other projects that I've been doing for uh, for for the past years as well, in mainly in Web three across different verticals, mm -hmm. um, such as Jade Vault, uh, Jade City. Uh, I, you had. You had um, James Bowater was on the show, James and he's Bowater. coming down to. Oh, this is exciting. Okay, you know it's good to do these shows. I, yeah. I was not aware of the tight connection between you and James, the Jameses, but yeah. now there is that. That is, that, he's great, and you're obviously, yeah. you know, you're a rock star. So I didn't, 
I didn't understand you guys were working together, but now I do. That's super. Yeah, I mean, he's he's got. Um... I, he's been an advisor for a bunch of a lot of companies for for many years, and is probably the probably one of the most well known people in in the uh, in the sector, isn't he? Um, yep. And he's, yeah, he's smarter started, than me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He'll be over next week, so we can uh, we can we, all meet up. Um, but yeah, Jade, Jade Vault is his uh, conception, and uh, he involved me in it very early on. Hmm. I think it's now about two years ago. So. That's one project we're working together where we we have a, a a jade mine in Kazakhstan. You know, I say we have, but we we're partnered up with the owners of the uh, jade mine. So we're not just saying we have one; we're actually invested in it, and they're invested in us. And um, and we're actually looking at an age old problem, which is commodity and commodity trade finance and commodity uh, mining. Sure. Uh, and we're looking at raising money in a in a non-conventional way, which is Web three. And so we've um, we've been doing that through Jade Vault, and now we've started Jade City, which basically is going to be a real world asset gamified marketplace with Jade backed NFTs, and um, so you can actually have the you can actually have the Jade as well. Um, and uh, we'll have a pool where you can uh, benefit from obviously the mining and sale of our jade. So we're really uh, we're really one of the, probably the best examples of of blockchain in real world assets. And we're in our private round now, um, jumping onto the scene. So it's exciting exciting times. I mean, you were mentioning before of... we started recording, you're advising ten companies. Yeah, I think we're on the board um, of. Yeah, I, I I have some I have some traditional finance companies where I sit on the board of as well in my in a sort of more compliance uh, background uh, way. So um, that's how I know so much about um, Abu Dhabi global markets and 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 the regulatory environment, you know, financial trade fi if you like. Um, but but most of my companies are in in the Web three space. So I'm uh, I'm a sort of founder with James and and a bunch and a few other guys who are actual miners so we have physical miners um in jade vault jade city um and uh then a bunch of others like nelthy is another company and they they're one of the companies that have gone through vara and are pretty pretty happy with them um and they're uh they basically offer blockchain etfs so they're they're kind of you know blocked uh, yeah, as we've all seen blackrock and everyone jump into the etf space these guys were developing etfs on baskets of cryptos um, very early on, so they've been very well supported in the industry, and I think they'll they'll be a force to be reckoned with because people have really got into this space now, haven't they? The ETF space, and if you can do it on a blockchain, then I think it's even more accessible and decentralized. Yeah, you know, the de decentralized community would would prefer it that way, I guess. Um, surely, I mean, I. I since we kind of were talking about the 2016 period and 17, you know, I, I guess the STOs are another mouse that didn't roar, but I would love to see security. I'd love to see, you know, there's, there's tokenized securities and then there's security tokens. And yeah. then there's having funds that operate purely on the blockchain. You know, there's, there's traditional legal funds that invest in crypto. And then it'd be nice to have cryptographic or blockchain based funds that also invest in crypto assets. I like, I think, I think that's the level of abstraction we need to get to. And then we're going to have a truly fluid financial system that's going to be very adaptable and very fast. So I, yeah. I think that's a, I think a, a blockchain based ETF is a fantastic idea. I think, it, yeah. I think it's another Lego piece. You know, they've, the, got, you know, they've got a lot of support. Um, so they're doing something right. And uh, I've been helping them for a couple of years and they were one of the first projects I put to Vara. Um, and uh, they've done pretty well because the use case is great. Um, and if they can get the right regulatory support, then you know they'll they'd be they'll be a prime example of of what you can do. Uh, but other ones as well. I have um, I work with a, a company. I'm one of the founders of a company called Urban Go, which mm -hmm. is um, say a mobility platform. So we've got a algorithm. We do sort of micro settlement solutions, proof of sustainability. Where uh, we've just got into Neon Accelerator in Saudi oh, wow. Arabia, so it's um, it's exciting days for that project. Ma well. Thank you so much. It's, yes. uh, <laughs> it's, That's it's, great. 
Is that, is that one of few words? I've, I've unashamedly been in the Middle East for sort of 19 years and can't speak a word of Arabic. <laughs> uh, I don't think you're the only one. If it makes you feel better, you're not the only one. <laughs> but Neom is a big deal. That, that's impressive. But look, let me let me sort of take this forward a little bit. You, you have such a rich history, both before Dubai and at Dubai. I mean, this, this, you're, we're talking decades here, and you've accomplished so much. We're, we're, let me ask you two questions that maybe you can answer in tandem. How do you see this environment, meaning Dubai, UAE, and GCC, but with respect to blockchain crypto developing over the next, say, five years? And then what do you see as your own path within that over the next five years? Yeah, good question. I think I think um, in terms of uh, the UAE, obviously the business environment's only got better because like any like any region with low tax or no tax, they come under fire eventually from you know OECD globally. Mm -hmm. um, so they've been very clever to uh, introduce um, some light taxation, corporate taxation, which will put the pressure off um, and allow companies to easily trade globally uh, with no, you know, being on no gray list or black list. So that was in hugely important. And I think they do make these incredibly sensible decisions and it must be very tough. So I think as a, as a business environment, it's, it's, it's only gonna get better. In terms of Web3 and technology- second, let, me, let me do one second. I'll, I'll, I'll agree with you and I'll, I'll show you how clever they were. It's a 9% yeah. corporate tax. Well, the, the lowest, EU member state tax is Hungary with 9%. So the EU can't complain about the UAE because if they're coming with the UAE, they have to complain about Hungary, which is a member yep. state. They didn't make yep. it 9.1%. They they said they made it exactly the same as the lowest EU tax. I mean, how smart yep. is that? And also there's as as you'll probably know, there's a there's a global uh minimum taxation yes. over I think it's like 800, 800 million or something. But you know these some of these larger companies, it still makes perfect sense for them to be in in the UAE because of you know global taxation. If you're in the UK, if you're in Holland, if you're in other places, yeah. it's above nine percent. That's for sure. Um, so for it makes sure. a lot of sense that they, that they chose that. In in terms of you know Web three, I think as you pointed out, there needs to be um, we're going to see some more improvements in terms of of regulatory support. I guess um, there'll be different challenges that come in. It's a it's a nightmare of an industry in terms of we get picked on by the globe, everyone. Um, not just as the UAE and Dubai, but the the Web three space gets very a hard deal whenever anything blows up. And maybe that's maybe that's right or not. I don't know, but um, I think it's handled in a in a in a in a proper way in the UAE. And Dubai has always been good at that. But I think you know with AI, they have an AI minister, as you know, um, where. Uh, we're incredibly excited about that space. They're doing a lot of initiatives uh, in the region. Um, so I think it's, you, you just don't see that in other countries so much. You see a bit of it in Singapore, spearheading these sort of different uh, innovations, technologies, uh, but you don't see it a lot a, a lot of uh, happening in other countries. So I think they've got a big advantage there. Um, you think, sorry, no, do, do you think Saudi is sort of waking up and may, Take some of this fire. How do you, how do you see I, the next five years? Are you going to move to Saudi? You know, if you were asking four years ago if I was moving to Dubai, I would have said no. <laughs> so I, I I understand where you're getting at with this question, but but Saudi's no longer Saudi, and yeah. I don't know what Saudi's going to look like in 2027 or 2028. And I kind of gave you yeah. a five year window there. Would I yeah. move there this moment? Based, on, I've I've never been there. I'm a I'm a loser. Okay, I'm still kind of I'm exploring my environment, and you know, try yeah. to bite, I'm biting off Oman and Qatar and Bahrain, but uh, yeah. but just just I know what you're getting at. I've heard from other people that they had very lucrative job offers there. They went there, and like six months later, a year later, they had to leave because the money just wasn't worth it because they're lonely and nothing's going on, and everyone's with their families, and they're they're not they don't have their families there, and forget it. But I've also heard yeah. recently that things are evolving, and it's really rocking and there's some serious money being made there. So I'll, well, I'll pass my, it back to you. My, my view is um, first mover advantage is always attractive. There's yes. a lot of opportunities, a lot of money. Um, is it for everyone? I don't know. I mean, uh, is there enough business there? Um, 
to make it uh, valuable enough for everyone to 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 lift up and go there. I don't know. Maybe maybe it's worth having offices out there for companies as well as Dubai. I don't see a big, a huge shift. Uh, but yeah, okay. like you, I have no idea what what the capacity is. I mean, some of the projects they have are just you just you just they've never been done before, so you can't really imagine what the future is going to be like there. Uh, true. Like you're talking about the like the line city, or yeah, yeah who who knows? It's either genius or crazy or both. I'm not sure which. Um, yeah. Now, one, one, of the, one thing you mentioned that I, I know is a big focus for you that we didn't really touch yet is AI. Yeah. Um, you seem to have had an epiphany with this, or to be now heavily invested with it. Can you discuss that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So, amongst all my other projects, I, um, you know, in the space, the space now is looking at, as we mentioned earlier, a little bit, the the the, the link between Web three blockchain and DLTs to yeah. to AI and and. Um, and large language models and and obviously the chips, NVIDIA and everything else that's happening at the moment, there's a big link. And I think, you know, that was, that's been known for a while, the legitis, legitis, or legitimacy of, um, of blockchain and how blockchain can be in, enhanced by AI and vice versa. So I say it was last year, I, a friend of mine who is the founder of an AI company which um, has done rather well. They're called QX Lab mm -hmm. AI, based in Dubai. They're um, they've they've all been you know grown up in Dubai, and they've been developing since two thousand and seventeen. Mm -hmm. So they're a large language model, and they're probably the nearest to Web three uh, out of all the large language models. You know, base layer because they've got a node based architecture, so P two P architecture. Which um, I think back when was when they started developing in 2018, it wasn't really uh, understood that that was a potential avenue. Uh, so I think around 2020 they realized that that it was going to work, and today have have proved it. So they've come out with a uh, a bunch of stuff, which is like you know text to text, uh, text to image is coming out. They have text to video, they have text to code. Um, one of the one of the great things about them is they have uh, you know perfected algorithms to self teach the large language model. So huh. it's been easier, it's it's been easier for them because they've managed to um, you know on the node based architecture they've managed to teach their LLM the languages rather than use translation. So the accuracy in languages is is phenomenal. Um, I think usually it's seventy percent with translation. There's like 99, 99.8% accuracy. In terms of text to things like, you know, the offerings like text to code mean that people will be able to code in all the languages that are supported and learn to code in all those languages that's, that are supported, which has never been done before. So this is job creation. This is, uh, this is just, you know, another sort of big part of what AI is going to bring to uh, to companies and individuals on a positive side, rather than some of the negatives that get sort of put out there by the press. I, I see what you're alluding to. I, I maybe we could go into this for a second. I, on one hand, am, maybe it doesn't affect me so much, who knows, but I am on one hand fearful of the mass job removal that's going to happen through AI, and I'm not entirely convinced we're not convinced at all that we're all going to become AI engineers, you know, and just move jobs. I think I think we're going to have a permanent unemployed and unemployable class. But but I'm also very much encouraged by how AI has become a learning partner in some cases, and how you. I mean, I I, I use it to learn, and you know, I'm not Mr. Tech guy. You know, I'm using it to learn German. I'm learning. You know, I. I if I want to learn how to code, I, I can ask it how to give me, you know, to give me some Python and learn how it did it and then have it correct my code. It's, it's become almost like a sparring partner. And yeah. you, you only get better when you spar against someone who's slightly better than you. You know, that's a from martial arts and everywhere else. Like, you know, if it's too easy, you don't learn anything. If it's too hard, you don't stand a chance. And the ability to, for AI to, to without, with, with complete endurance and patience, and adaptability to cheat to teach us, to stay with us, like some sensei. 
I think really opens up human possibility. So I, I don't, I don't know if it's fear mongering by the press. Like you kind of alluded to that, but I, I think, I think this is a very complex phenomenon that it's, you should understand we need to have a nuanced opinion about. So feel free to comment <laughs> or not. No, I, I agree. There's a lot of, you know, we, Oh, James, you're freezing. Um, and it has to be used responsibly. And, you know, the, the compliance bit, the regulatory bit needs to be um, needs to be adequate for sure. So we're we're all about that. We're, we've teamed up with DMCC, funnily enough, um, to be uh, an anchor at the AI center that's coming up at DMCC. So we're going to be... Um, oh, I, I, I think I just heard something here first. So the DMCC is coming with an AI center. Yeah, haven't you seen Ahmed's posts? He um, he's he's got a he's got a um, Telegram, I think, or a, you know oh. Instagram. Uh, you, you know, I think I saw them, but it just became real once you said it. Yeah, How's exactly. That? I, That's the impact. It's going to be opening soon, and and you know we're there to support. We're there to as a as a base layer to uh, provide infrastructure for companies to build on to give our API access. Um, so it's going to be a really exciting time. Um, I think everyone needs to learn a bit. But the crossover between AI and and other verticals, other uh, technology, I think is the most interesting part of this. I mean, I think no one is doing anything new without involving AI, and everyone is is also looking at at quantum at the moment and um, what that means for for AI and for blockchain. We we one interesting thing that not a lot of people know about is um, there's a project that I'm part of the team as well called Secret Mountain, which is, I don't know, do you know A.R. Raman? He's, a, I don't think he's so. one of the stars in India, a BAFTA Grammy winner. Um, mm -hmm. He did Slumdog Millionaire. He did the music. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, so we're building a, um, a, me a, a meta band for, for him or with him. Um, so he's going to have six characters with digital twins. Um, we have tech partners now, which the technology is just unbelievable. Uh, our particular partner there is Hyperreal in the States. Mm. And the stuff they are coming out with is just unbelievable. So, you know, all of these companies using AR, um, AI, uh, a combination of te new technologies. And I think that's the the beautiful thing. It's like, it'll, it'll, it'll result in a faster, safer, uh, more acceptable Web3 space, I guess, as well as um, as all the tools that we're having, like your German lessons. <laughs> <laughs> good, good reference. All right, uh, we're, we're coming up on time and you know, you, you did a lot to cover with you, but let me just kind of end with this. Who, who watching this should connect with you and who do you want to connect with? Well, Funnily enough, I do have a lot of calls throughout the day that I don't really benefit from, apart from you know having the pleasure of giving people advice on usually on the UA um, on you know sort of what they should do, and it's not part of my business anymore. I don't really get get anything out of it, but I always get a thrill out of it, and I like to connect everyone. So I'm always happy to talk to anyone, to be honest. Um, anyone and that's a very charitable answer, but. Let's say if your dream phone call would be from. I guess focused on AI would be from um, other AI companies wanting to collaborate, not just uh, other base layer LLMs, but also people wanting to build on um, on our AI uh, base layer. So that would be very useful. Um, I'd love to explore that and involve the team. Uh, in terms of our projects, whether it's Secret Mountain or Jade Vault or Nelthy, whatever, anyone that has any interest in to collaborate, partner, invest, whatever, always happy to discuss. Got it. And when you're talking about the AI base, la base layer, you're talking about the DMCC AI centers base layer? Right here? Yeah, with QX, with QX Labs AI QX, now. QX, okay, got it. We, it's called Ask QX, and we have we have over 15 million users, um, and we only just went live because we've been in stealth mode for a while. Um, so, so with 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 our um, LLM, I'm talking about you know Ask QX, but of course from I think May 
June uh, we're with DMCC at the D at the AI Center. Um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of other announcements on the on the back of that as well. But we're there to to help them and to help everyone else. Got it. So maybe we can include links to both in the show notes, just so everyone can okay. see what's going on. Yeah. Um, James, you're awesome. You gave a lot of your time. I really appreciate. it. I really admire you. You're you're a man among men. You've accomplished a lot. You know, good job. Thank you Thank for you everything. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I just, I just love the environment. You know, it's just such a fun place to work in. I know, you know, people like you just enjoy it. It's just fun and not work, is it? <laughs> you, you know what? I'll, I'll give it even more of a compliment. It's work I enjoy. You know how rare that that's, is? That's true, yeah. yeah. It's amazing. All right, James, I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you. Amazing. Good job. <laughs>